All right, I am so excited to have Senator Paul here. Um, because I think we're looking at the, the future of the Republican Party. It is libertarianism or a, a libertarian style conservatism is, is, is coming to power. But what we don't know is how this, when it comes to the mainstream, interacts with innovation. And so that's what we're going to explore. Uh, so the first question I have is, last year in a document uh, you co-wrote with your father, you said that the technology revolution has come all in five years without government permission. And on the other hand, the birth of the internet was a, a government-funded laboratory, and public universities played a vital role. So my question is to you, does, is government in some ways essential to innovation? You know, I would say that there was a role, obviously, you know, for government and coming out of universities and with some government money with the, with the organization of it. But the real explosion of the Internet, I think, was the lack of control, that it was a place where people went where they weren't told what to do. And you look at the different industries we have and that uh, the success of the Internet and Internet companies versus, you know, for example, a, a traditional industry or manufacturing, Part of the reason is we, government was already so involved in all these other industries with rules and regulations that you couldn't innovate. And so I think that's what we need to protect against with, with the Internet is that it's been very free and open place. And we don't want to let government get too involved with it because I think that will stifle innovation. In a, in a poll leadership, do you think uh, funding for science and scientific innovation goes up, down, or stays about the same? You know, I've always said that uh, things that people uh, say are good things that government can do, whether or not it's R&D or whether it's a humanitarian purpose, that in the context of spending money that comes in, I don't have a real great uh, sort of say, oh, we can't spend money on this. My biggest problem is we bring in $2.8 trillion and we spend $3.8 trillion. So in the concept of a budget that's $3.8 trillion, if you come to me and say, oh, we want some government R&D for universities for development of this, I'm like, well, tell me what you're going to cut. Because we can't, in the old days, we just added on to things. We just kept adding on and adding on, and that's what happens now. There is no prioritization in government of spending. So you might say, well, maybe R&D is more important than, let's say, we spent $3 million on Twiggy the squirrel last year. Twiggy the squirrel is a water skiing squirrel that we advertise American walnuts in India, but we spend $3 million of taxpayer money. So if you told me, well, maybe some R&D for studying diabetes or you know, a scientific pursuit, I would say, well, you know, I think I'd rather spend the $3 million on R&D if it doesn't look like there's a market uh, for that. But I would also say that there is a marketplace that does support many things as far as scientific advancement. A lot of scientific advancement, some comes from universities, but quite a bit of it comes from people who actually want to make money selling what they're trying to discover. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the NSA. I think uh, you are in almost total alignment with the tech industry, um, calling for an end to, to bulk collection of data uh, and the disclosure of users who are spied on. Um, except, uh, I believe you said that Snowden and Intelligence Director James Clapper should share a prison <laughs> cell. Um, as, as a leader, what do you think Snowden's punishment should be, and how can it encourage more whistleblowing activity? And remind you, I'm looking yeah. for specifics because we want to know exactly how you plan yeah. to treat information activists. You know, I, I was trying to be provocative, and sometimes I do that. And as far as, as far as uh, you know, sharing a cell, and I was trying to make the point that you have some people who I think have sort of gone crazy over the top, and they're like, you know, they if they saw Edward Snowden, they'd lynch him or shoot him or hang him from the closest tree. And I think those people need to realize when they're saying things like that, which are absurd, I think. But when they're saying things like that, that they need to realize that if they're so big on that the law has to be what the law is, James Clapper lied, committed perjury, and it's five years in prison. So if they want to throw the book at Snowden, they need to equally look at James Clapper. Now, I think really ever since the, 19, the Espionage Act of 1917, we've gone overboard on this. And you want to look at what happened in the aftermath and during World War I to labor activists, socialists, just people who disagreed with the war, who disagreed with the draft. We put people in jail for 10 and 20 years. We had something called the Sedition Act of 1917, 
and uh, you know, a minister was put in jail for 15 years. Eugene Debs was a socialist candidate, labor candidate back in, in the teens. He was put in jail for 20 years. So we, we, we have to be careful in times of war or in times of threat to our country that we don't go crazy on penalties. The current penalties on the book, particularly if you said that Snowden committed, um, was a traitor, you know, could be the death penalty. I think that his motives were good. I think his motives were saying that this is something that's unconstitutional and the government shouldn't be doing. A federal judge has already agreed with him. However, on the other side of the coin, I don't think that uh, we can completely just have no secrets. If you're you know, a sergeant in the military or a captain in the military, I don't think you can just download all the government secrets and put them out on the internet. There do have to be some rules and there, there are some problems with disclosing secrets and people could die. Do I think the other side has overstated what Snowden has done as far as endangering things? I think, the, and I say this a little bit to be, to be funny, but also because it's true, the real secret he, he announced to the world was not that we're spying on terrorists, it's that we're spying on Americans. That's the real news, is that all Americans' records are being collected. Do you think there was a terrorist anywhere in the world that didn't already feel like their phone was being listened to? I just didn't realize that they were collecting all of our records, you know, all of the time. And so um, I really think you can't have no rules. Could you have a whistleblower program? And if you adhere to that, go through that, and maybe he's not punished? Maybe, but he didn't go that route. The other problem for Snowden from a historical point of view is that history is going to record that uh, he's taken up residence in a country that's not real good with sort of Bill of Rights issues and privacy and that kind of thing. And so that's going to taint him somewhat in history. It's not really ultimately my job to make a judgment on him other than that to me the issue is really important and without him we would have never known any of this and uh, so I think in that sense he has served uh, the country in having a real great debate over our privacy and what the government can look at and shouldn't look at. You've also called him a you know a civil disobedient I mean what, what do you think should happen to him if he comes so, back to the United States? Well many have pushed back you know the people who are big fans of uh, the national surveillance state and don't really care too much about your Bill of Rights they've pushed back and said Oh, Martin Luther King stayed and, and faced his medicine, you know, he was in jail in Birmingham. Well, that's true, but Martin Luther King was in jail for 33 days, and that's what he faced. He didn't face life imprisonment or the death penalty. So the question to me is, many that have opposed me on this have said, oh, you can't, you're crazy, you can't be a civil disobedient unless you are willing to, to face the time. But to me, that would mean then you have to be a martyr. You would have to say, oh, you can't be a civil disobedient without being a martyr because People are calling for the death penalty for him, and I think that's inappropriate. What exactly his penalty is, I haven't really figured out or decided that I want to publicly say he should get this or he shouldn't get this or this. I've just come out and said what I believe is that he doesn't deserve the death penalty or life imprisonment. But at the same time, we still do have to have laws. If any of you here work for government and you signed a contract, Contracts are important. If you sign a contract, it's just like in, insider trading. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the stuff. We've gone overboard on some of the insider trading thing. But if you work for a big company on Wall Street and you sign an agreement, if you steal their secrets and give them to people, you've committed a crime and you broke your contract and you should be punished for that. Um, so even though I'm a big believer in open transmission of information, I'm also a big believer in contracts. Okay. Um, you once told me that Bush Republicans don't do well in Silicon Valley. Um, but even when you go out to fundraise, the household names from Google and Twitter and Facebook are still in Camp Obama and maybe Camp Hillary. Um, the question is, how do you think the Republican Party fundamentally must change to capture a majority of interest among technologists? I think in 2016, if you had a more libertarian-leaning uh, Republican and you had someone like Hillary Clinton, um, I think you could actually completely transform where people think they are and what party they think they have allegiance for. Who's been the biggest uh, proponent of going to war in the Middle East and getting involved in Syria, funneling arms? Hillary Clinton. Has she been anyone who sa said anything about privacy? She's been a big proponent of the surveillance state and the NSA. So I think there's a, is a chance that if you had someone like that on the Democrat side, that people who do care about their privacy and do care about the freedom of the internet might all of a sudden say, you know what? Um, you know, Democrats really aren't representing me. And I guess the perception, I don't know everything about everything about Silicon Valley, but on my trips out there, I get the feeling people come up and say, well, I supported President Obama, but I'm more conservative on taxes and fiscal issues and balanced budgets than he is. 
but on, on, on social issues, I'm more liberal than where the Republicans are. So I think there really is sort of a third way for many in, in Silicon Valley in the sense, or high tech industry in the sense that I think they're looking for something that's not, they don't neatly fit in either box of either party. I want to make sure I got that correct. Did, were you saying that uh, Hillary Clinton was a proponent of the surveillance state? Yeah, I would say that she has never been a critic of the surveillance state. She's never been an advocate of, uh, you know, if, if Ron Wyden were here, he's a Democrat, I would say, who is an advocate of privacy. I would not put Hillary Clinton in that category. Okay. Um, so speaking of kind of the rise of libertarianism, uh, you and especially your father are crazy popular on the web. Um, yet these netizens are getting a serious pushback from Republican leaders, especially in the House. So my question, I have two questions on this. Do you think this is just a, this internet libertarianism is just an overly vocal minority? Or are, is your party's leadership ignoring an important part of this country? You know, I think that there is a growing movement. And if you look at the youth, for example, the youth voted three to one for President Obama. But if you look at the polling data on the youth right now, they're, because of the NSA spying, and that it sort of looks like President Obama has become an extension of the Bush administration, but actually with even less concern for civil liberties than the Bush administration. There hadn't been as, much people, as many people speaking out on this, but I think that if you think it through, there was vociferous and sort of almost a hatred for Bush, you know, from people who believed in civil liberties and thought he had gone too far in the war. President Obama's carried on all of those things. He did bring some troops home, but as far as a surveillance state and your right to privacy, he's gone much beyond what Bush had begun. And so I think there is a, uh, a growing mood among young people looking for something different. And I think that people aren't as, uh, as wedded to one party or the other as they used to be. When you look at polling data, you'll see a lot of people consider themselves to be independent. And I think young people are among that. I think people in Silicon Valley are among that. That uh, I mean, there are people who supported the president in 2008 who didn't support him in 2012, prominent people in Silicon Valley who switched in 2012. And so um, no, I think there is an opening. One thing that's very concerning uh, that my readers tell me is that the, the Republican Party seems almost anti-science in some ways, denying evolution and others. Um, how are, do you plan to speak out against that? I mean, how do you plan to change that in the Republican Party, especially the perception? You know, I think, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure if there is an exact answer, but I don't think the Republican Party has ever been anti-science. Are there some people who promote a, a different understanding of science than the rest of us would agree to? Yeah, there are a few, but, and some of them might be in the Republican Party, but I think that by and large you don't find, uh, I think we get characterized. You know, you get people who, sort of are from one party and they say something and they say, oh, that's the way all Republicans believe. And the same happens to Democrats as well. Um, but, you know, I come from a science background. I'm a physician. I, I come from a, a background of science. And so I don't think there'll be anything you'll hear coming from me that it's anti-science. Why do you think libertarianists are, libertarianism is so popular on the web? Why do you think they are so effective at using web tools? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but I think there's a big, uh, huge bunch of people that are a part of this Leave Me Alone coalition is what I like to describe it as. And uh, the internet is a place f for freedom and for being able to do what you, it's a place that people are, are gra they gravitate to it because um, one, they have, they have a lot of freedom. Not only are there a lot of people who just sort of are individual, but even when they work for big companies, you know, when I've been out and visited, you know, Google or Facebook, when you go in, there's an atmosphere not of structure, there's an atmosphere of, you know, you know, you can't go five steps without being able to stop and have food or a nap or play ping pong or something, you know. And uh, so I think it's, it's, it's less rigidity and more openness and I think people are attracted uh, to that, and it's sort of a libertarian sort of sense of, uh, you know, as long as I'm not hurting somebody else, leave me alone to do what I want to do. Uh, labor unions, uh, they are almost non-existent in tech companies and have vigorously fought for more regulations against startups. Do you think labor unions have a future in the U.S.? And why do you think they often butt heads with innovators? Um, in general, I'm not opposed to uh, the small guy organizing to have leverage against the big guy. And the interesting thing about sort of labor and the idea of, of organizing is that when you look at the antitrust laws, 
the intention was to sort of keep uh, business from getting so big that labor would have no leverage or other the consumer would have no leverage. But the interesting thing is, is that really right now, the small guy has no leverage. Like I'm a physician, I'm a small guy and in my individual practice, I have almost no leverage. They won't let me organize with other physicians to try to negotiate my contract with the insurance company. Or they don't let small retailers band together and have 10,000 retailers say, okay, this is my representative. You talk to him at MasterCard and Visa and say, now we have leverage. So I, I think really the antitrust laws have, have, uh, have made it harder, not just for labor, but for the small guy to organize because they call that collusion and it's actually a mistake. So really the antitrust laws, I think, are keeping the small guy down and the big guy in place sometimes and that we need to change the, I have a bill to change the antitrust laws because I, I hear from like independent pharmacists that we have no leverage against the big chains. But I'd let the independent pharmacists organize. I'd let the independent physicians organize. I'd let the retailers organize so they can have leverage against uh, bigger companies. All that's a roundabout way to say that there is a, is a, is a place for organization but for the most part, I think labor unions had their, their heyday was in trying to get rid of really horrific working conditions with people missing fingers and losing limbs and having no safety at work and 100-hour work weeks and things like that. I don't think they really have the place uh, so much really in the high-tech industry because I think, one, they're not paying, as far as I know, they're not paying slave wages in Silicon Valley or anything. No. No, no, we're, 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 we're doing quite well. Yeah. Um, and in, in a previous interview, you once called Silicon Valley's kind of do-gooderism. You've described it as communitarian. What did you mean by that? And does that conflict with your own philosophy? I don't remember saying that, but I'll accept that I might have. Um, you know, I think there is uh, a sense, particularly in young people, they, they still want to make money, they want to do things that are successful, but I think they're socially conscious in the sense that they want to also do things that protect the environment. And I'm not saying that in a bad way, so I'm not sure if you were thinking I was saying it in a bad way, but I say it actually in a good way. I have actually uh, am supportive of a bill in, in our legislation about uh, letting people incorporate as, uh, I think it's called B corporations. So where you, uh, right now the rules are such that if you are a for-profit corporation, if I say, well, I want to buy from this person because they're environmentally friendly, you're not allowed to because you're if they cost more, you're doing a disservice to your stockholders. And so I'm for opening up some of those corporate laws, allowing some companies and even regular companies. You ought to be, if your company and your stockholders are fine with it, they can always leave your company if they don't like what you're doing. But you should be able to do things even if they're not the least expensive thing because you think this is good for the environment. So I think there's a certain community spirit uh, within people, particularly young people, with the way they approach business. Um, patents and intellectual property. Um, <laughs> can, I ha can I call my lawyer? <laughs> Please do, <laughs> on the phone. Um, some people think that patents are a kind of legalized government monopoly. Yeah. And they're strangling innovation. Do you see patents as a kind of legalized monopoly? No, and I think that, you know, there are, and there are, and I can remember this question from 30 years ago, that there were libertarians, and our libertarians have written that, yeah, you shouldn't just have any patents, the market will just sort of straighten this out. But I, I think that uh, property and intellectual property should be, you know, and it takes a long time sometimes to develop it and a lot of resources, but I think there ought to be a protection for, uh, for, uh, for intellectual property. The patent's really complicated, and that's why I joked about having a lawyer, is that, um, the the rules are so complicated, you know, and how we fix it is complicated. We say, went, you know, say went patents against software. That's going to be coming up probably in the spring. What's your position on that? Right. Well, I'm not sure because I'm not sure I've seen the bill or understand the bill yet. Um, the last time we did patent a year or two ago, we did some kind of patent reform, and I never was quite sure exactly what we're doing. There was one amendment on it I actually couldn't vote on because I couldn't understand the amendment or couldn't understand the the right or the wrong side of it because it's it's complicated. The patent law, and there are two sides to it. And even with protection of intellectual property, the question is, for example, I think with uh, books we do, I think, life of the author in 70 years. We, you know, there's patent limits. Is there an absolute right or wrong to what the limit should be on patents? I don't know. There are some who argue, well, maybe drug patents are too long. That's why drug prices are too high. Um, maybe. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the exact limit to when a patent should, should end. 
I do know that part of the problem with, with drugs is that it takes a long time to approve them. So it's an enormous cost because the FDA burden of trying to get something approved, I think, has gone too far. We want safety, but now we've got burdensome bureaucracy that's taking millions of dollars to get through that bureaucracy to get something approved. Um, the bottom line is I'm open-minded on it. I also see some of the problems of people going through and just for uh, legal purposes challenging everybody's patent just to try to get a payday on that. And so I see the problem of that as well. Uh, so one more question, and then I know you have to run. You have a very busy day. Um, the rise of kind of a libertarian-leaning conservative, um, and to some extent the Tea Party, do you think that would exist without the Internet? No, and in fact, I think uh, that one of the beauties of the Internet in political discourse is that it gives voice to uh, uh, minority voices, to voices that uh, weren't necessarily within the mainstream of both parties. When you had three television networks, you know, so I, I know cable is not the Internet, but it was a beginning of a revolution in, info, in information. So you have, you know, dozens of television stations now, but you also have the Internet. And there's going to come a time, you know, television like in New York City, a congressional race is so expensive they can't afford to be on television in New York City for the most part. So the advertising is probably for the most part either cable or on the internet. And uh, the internet uh, to me is fascinating. It's like I keep, uh, you know, I, I, I do a search and I'm looking at stuff at night and I was like, wow, my ads are everywhere. But they've figured out what I'm looking you know. at, and that's how my ad's on, you know. So, I mean, uh, they've figured out the preferences. I must meet the preference of somebody who would support me because I, my ads show up somewhere. So, uh, but it is kind of fascinating how you can target advertising in a much, you know, you're not advertising to everybody. You're advertising to people who are already kind of interested in it. But I guess it to one other point I'd like to make before I go is that... Um, there is a difference, and this is very important if you're in the world of information and you make money off information. If you Google and you sell yourself on that information and information is, is internally distributed to people on products, um, if we lump that in with the government and we say all of that's bad, all information sharing is bad, or all uh, allowing people to know information about you is bad, that's a real problem because the, uh, the model of the Internet does require uh, information to, to go around. And I don't think it's the same. And it's important that we understand that it's not the same. And when I went to Google, I told them it's important that people not perceive Gmail to be government mail. Because if they do, if they think that all privacy is the same and that you can't make a contract, you can't say, oh, I agree to have my information anonymously used for buyers and shoppers to, to know what I like to buy so they can send me shoes that I like to buy when I get on a certain website. Uh, if we think that that's an invasion of our privacy, you're going to get government blanket come in and they're going to kill everything. They're not only going to go after the government, which we should do, they're going to, if they equate government and uh, search engines and the Internet as the same thing. So do you think there should be any regulations on the way Google collects information and um, it uh, should be a, It should be a contract. It should be a contract. So and, long as uh, users agree to it, you think it's generally okay? Yeah, and here, but here's the other thing. We got, we, and this is something they may not like me for, but we made a mistake in the Patriot Act by saying we immunize telephone companies and all the Internet people from being sued. I want a contract with Google, but I want them to adhere to my contract, and as long as they do, it's fine, and we can negotiate. If they start saying they're going to send people knocking on my door at home and knowing my name, I'm probably not going to use their search engine. But if they can keep it anonymous and they're going to do my preferences and I make an agreement, it really is about contracts. But my other suggestion to a lot of these companies, and I, you know, this is coming from someone who's not in the business, but I'm, I'm got a lot of free advice. You can pay me. You can pay. You can pay me in Bitcoin if it's good advice. Um, but my advice is, is that it is very important for them to put up a fight, and I know they are putting up a fight. But I'd say even more against the government and, and the invasion of privacy. And my understanding, just peripherally, is that this has hurt a lot of these companies in Europe because they think we're trying to fight for Americans, but we don't care at all about Europeans. And if that's true, they're going to go to European companies. And we have to put up a fight, and I have a fight. I'm suing the NSA, and I would love anybody that wants to support that fight. It's, uh, you can support it, but it can't be just about transparency. A lot of these companies have gotten together, and they're doing, I support what they're saying on, you should, t you know, and President Obama's respondent said, you have to show us, you know, some of these orders can become public. That's it. That's good that it's transparent, but that's not the end of it. The government shouldn't be collecting this data. So I want these companies, and some of you are out there, support the next step. And the next step is, is it constitutional to collect with a single warrant to Verizon 
can you collect 100 million people's records? My answer is no. You cannot. It should name the person. The Fourth Amendment says you name the person. So what I think, and I think it's also good for your business model if you're out there, support going the next step, which is really shutting down the collection or fighting in a legal way. You can take this to the Supreme Court if you can? Yes. Yeah, I think, I think we will go. We have 350,000 people who have signed up. But I would like people on the Internet to go out and really promote our lawsuit, and let's get 3 million. You know, let's get 10 million people on our lawsuit. And we could, if we did the same kind of SOPA, PIPA battle that we did, that the Internet got going on, if we got everybody going on this and we got them signed up for this lawsuit, 10 million people signed up for a lawsuit, sent a message, 300,000 sends a message. But I think the message is also good for your business because you need to go the extra mile to show, and I know you are fighting the government and a lot of it's been secret, but you need to go the extra mile to show your customers that in Europe and in the world that you're going to stand up to what is unconstitutional, and you're going to stand up and say, not just that it be transparent, the court orders, that to me is like, yeah, I'm for that, but it, I, it should be, we're going to oppose the government collecting our records unless they name an individual and they want that individual's records. And if they have to search for the government, if they have to search for individuals, do you think they should in the future be immunized to that, or you want to change that? I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't like immunity. I, I think uh, really you should honor your contract. If I tell all of you that your privacy agreement can be breached and you can't be sued, what goal do you ever have to keep your pri your privacy agreement's only good if you think that if we uh, if we abrogate our privacy agreement? So that's why see I'm not for regulating privacy agreements. I'm not regulating any of these search engines for what they can do and how information goes if we have a privacy agreement. But if you tell me that the privacy agreement is no good and you're gonna the, that I can't sue you if you breach my privacy agreement, then I'm I'm getting kind of angry at the private entities then too, and that's where we are. The Patriot Act says that I can't sue the phone company. I have a privacy agreement. They've got you know, they advertise it when you're waiting on hold with them. They're like, we are protecting your privacy and doing all this. Well, yeah, they are, but I can't sue them if they break my contract. I have to be able to sue them in order for them to uh, adhere to their contract. That is, a, that is a fascinating idea. I I have not heard that proposed yet. Right, and that's the only area where I sometimes will disagree because some of the companies will say, oh, well, we don't, obviously don't want to be sued, so for business reasons, we'd like the Patriot Act, that part of the Patriot Act. But really, you have to have that because that's the check and balance to the consumer on my information is that you are going to abide by your contract. And uh, so that's something I, I think we ought to change as we go forward. But also, I'm hoping, we have a website we just put up called defendthefourth.com. And on that, people can sign up for the lawsuit, and I'm hoping we'll rally more people to try to get to this cause. We will probably file our lawsuit, hopefully, within the next week. We have the complaint mostly written. Last week, the Federal Board on Privacy and Civil Liberties came out with uh, more harsh statements saying it's illegal and unconstitutional what they're doing. It isn't really about having more internal controls and having more lawyers look at it. It's about whether or not you should be collecting the data at all. We don't think they should collect the data indiscriminately. I'm all for it. If they think you're a terrorist and they can present to a judge, they can have your information, but they shouldn't go to the company that holds your information and say, we want everybody that you hold information for. That's wrong. That's indiscriminate. That's a generalized warrant. That's akin to the writs of assistance that we had at the time of the revolution, and that's why we passed the Fourth Amendment, so we wouldn't have that. Okay, just one more question, and then I'll let you leave. Um, <coughs> As you understand it, what is the future of libertarianism in the Republican Party? If not just small government. Well, you know, I think it has a bright future because I think it, it some of it's an old-fashioned idea and some of it's a new idea. The old-fashioned idea is federalism. Federalism is that you devolve power and that the power is not all in Washington, it's in different places. But the other aspect of federalism is that you can agree to disagree. So, for example, uh, the concept of what the government should be involved with, and particularly like on social issues, is different in Alabama than it is in San Francisco. Everybody agree? It's a little bit different. But if you want to force a universal, either way, let's say in Washington you want to, you want to enforce a real conservative uh, doctrine on social issues, then you're going to have to tell San Francisco they can't have their rules, or New York can't have their own idea of the way they want it. But if you go the opposite way, and I think we're in danger of maybe going the opposite way, that Washington's going to dictate to Alabama, I don't think it makes for good relations. So I think that part of federalism is agreeing to disagree. So if you live in Alabama and you have one conception of, of sort of some of the social issues, and you live in San Francisco and you have a different, 
the best way we can get along as a country is to agree to disagree. And we have some that have uh, different views than others. And we have some laws that are slightly different at the local level, too. And it's not a one-size-fits-all. But it's complicated because we have some things like the federal tax code and federal benefits. And so um, that, that's just uh, my hope is that we can sort of figure out some of these more contentious issues by agreeing to disagree and having a little bit difference between uh, localities. All right. Fascinating, Senator. Thank you so much for All joining right. us. Thank you. Thanks for having me.